So folks, in this edition of Regis Talks About Things, pulling in the aid of Twist Chat here to talk about cards that have been murdered by Voyage to the Sunken City. As we always do, I like to take a look at the evolution of cards over time and see just how much they've changed, you know, in the last year, last eight years, in some cases, like the example you'll see behind us here, where Treasure Guard is the latest in a very, very long line of cards that have murdered Silverback Patriarch. This guy has died hundreds of times. Once again, Treasure Guard is just dramatically better. Uh, not only, you know, better base stats with taunt and a minion type, but also death rattle, draw a card. Stop, stop, he's already dead. But I like to point out Patriarch, of course, every time. Now, obviously, this is fine. Treasure Guard is a totally fine card at this stage in Hearthstone. I don't think it's too powerful. It's solid, decks are running it, right? It's good. Uh, it's being played with Drek'thar, being played with Naga stuff in many cases. Solid card, but I don't think outside the bounds of, of where it should be, it feels healthy and Patriarch, you know, was always a, a pretty weak, terrible card, even as far back as his debut. He really wasn't getting played. So this is an example of a totally fine evolution. It was a murder. Yes. Patriarch is dead once again, but uh, that's fine. That's good. Sometimes we just need new versions of cards that do better things. So uh, I think Treasure Guard's a, a nice, healthy design, fits nicely into the Naga world and is a totally fine example of a murder in Hearthstone. Next up. This one is equally uh, obvious, I think, but Unsleeping Soul has been murdered by a Sharin ritual. And spoiler alert, this one's going to be in the thumbnail because I already made it. <laughs> Two priest four mana silence synergy cards here. Unsleeping Soul, it just silenced a friendly minion and it just gave you a copy of it. Uh, a Sharin ritual on the other hand, silences any minion and gives you a copy of it. So, of course, you can use it on your own stuff if you want, but you can also use it on your opponent's stuff. So you don't have to rely on your own cards necessarily. You can still use this to get some silence value against your opponent's stuff, uh, which can sometimes be nice to get that extra body on board. Like, yeah, here's a silence too, but that's OK. Sometimes you just want to equalize the board a little bit, take a swing, use a shadow or death and so on. And then on top of that, of course, you get Sunken Ritual with a Sharn Ritual, which puts a really good card on the bottom of your deck. It basically puts a double Unsleeping Soul on the bottom of your deck. Or no, it doesn't, because you can silence your enemy minions again. <laughs> so all in all, the top half is already better, and then you get this whole second bottom half, the Sunken half that's just crazy strong, right? It's way, way, way better. Now, Unsleeping Soul has a Shadow tag. I mean, a yeah, Shadow Priest could use that a little better, but... All in all, uh, this is good. And I think another healthy example, I don't feel like a shard ritual is too broken. It's been good in Mill Priest with the shellfish, but that's, you know, not a mega high tier deck or anything. Totally fine example of upping the power level of this card to modern standards, but not taking it too far. This is not, you know, broken the game because of how crazy strong it is, which is really what we're looking for. You know, more interesting, more engaging designs. It's fine to, to kind of harken back to old cards as long as they're made more compelling, easier to build towards. And I think this is a, a perfect example of that. I didn't realize how much stronger the ritual was until just now. Yeah, it, as I was looking for cards, it was like, this was one of the most like obvious transparent comparisons. You know, sometimes you're kind of doing a little guesswork in your comparison, but uh, it was pretty obvious. Now this one's intriguing. This, this is only a little bit of a murder. You know, like you, you know, you, you punched it and they accidentally died. It was like a manslaughter. <laughs> this is this is a me a meager manslaughter, not an actual murder. Uh, because Void Gill versus Void Analyst, by the way, clearly the names uh, are referencing one another here. Uh, the Void Gill only gains one attack over the Void Analyst, and you might say, well, that's not much at all, right? I would argue, though, of course, that I think Murloc buffs. And the Murloc tag on the minion is probably a more exploitable or more useful synergy in general than demons. Now, Warlock has obviously had some some good demons, but even traditional zoo decks weren't super focused on the demon synergies. They had some because that's the cards they had, you know, Flame Imps and Voidwalkers and stuff, but they weren't usually trying to exploit that synergy too much. It didn't matter necessarily that they were demons all that often. 
And when it did matter, usually big demons, because stuff like Skull of the Minari, right? You wanted big demons if you cared about demons. So Void Analyst never really mattered much. It wasn't a card that was particularly useful uh, with its demon hand buff. Whereas Void Gill, you could imagine it being more useful. It's not exactly, you know, rocking anybody's world right now, currently in Hearthstone, but a couple more Murlocs, and you could see Murloc hand buff coming together rather nicely. Got more immediate support cards like the Twin Fin, Fin, Twin, Twin, Fin, 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 Twin. Twin Fins? I think that's the name, right? <laughs> Malganus will return, and Void Analyst will enable him, huh? <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a pretty cool example, I thought. The Mothership versus the Piloted Sky Golem. Remember Piloted Sky Golem, the big brother of Piloted Shredder? Uh, Mothership has come along, and it's way better because it has Rush. It's really hard sometimes to commit a six-mana minion that doesn't immediately interact with the board. It was a little easier back in the day. Nowadays, though, you need that reactivity. And uh, Mothership provides that at only the cost of one attack. So it's really not losing too much from an attack standpoint. But that rush makes it immediately impactful. And, of course, I would argue that getting six mana uh, worth of stuff or up to six mana, let's say, worth of stuff off the Death Rattle is, on average, much better than getting exactly four mana worth of stuff. Uh, on average, I don't know what the actual average breaks down to, but there aren't that many one mana mechs. There are a lot more two and three mana mechs. So usually you're going to get four to six mana worth of stuff anyway. And often two bodies is better than just one body anyway. And they're mechs, which are often going to be synergistic, whereas the Sky Golem is just any random old minion. So you just get some garbage battle cry with really bad stats. Whereas with the Mothership, you get stuff that synergizes with your deck and game plan and keeps the mech train flowing. So... Basically, in almost every way except attack, Mothership pretty much murders the piloted Sky Golem. And that's why Mothership's getting played even today. I, I, it's hard to get like six mana cards like this into action in Modern Hearthstone, but Mothership has managed to do it. It's a good enough card. It just has a lot going on. I also thought about comparing this to Savannah High Main. Think about that. Savannah High Main used to be like the scariest, craziest card. And Mothership is basically a rushing Savannah High Main. That's kind of crazy to think about. All right, next up. Speaking of one mana, one one mechs, the Click Clocker versus the Argent Squire. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward comparison again to a classic card. And obviously Click Clocker has the same base stat line and keyword, but has the mech tag for additional mech synergies and the mech hand buff as well. And... Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's just obviously better. Uh, you know, th there's always this example or this conversation about power creep, which I'm not saying really any of these cards are power creeping necessarily, but Click Clocker might actually be an example of power creep because Argent Squire is a card that has gotten played quite a bit in Hearthstone. It's been good enough for a lot of just aggro and tempo decks. Kind of like we see the same thing with Righteous Protector even getting played today in Paladin. The taunt there is very important, obviously. But Argent Squire still got played. It was a card that was run in Zoo decks, Tempo decks, and Click Clocker is just a straight-up better version of it that is way more synergistic for mech game plans, but similarly powerful for non-mech game plans, which I think is, is, a, is a pretty cool evolution of it. And if it is power creep, you know, uh, <laughs> I think it's kind of a good example of that, how it's, it's creeping in a really niche or specific direction but not creeping generally. So, you know, it's only creep within a specific environment and that kind of tightens it up or puts reins on how far it can snowball, right? As opposed to uh, just generally good cards that are better that can be put into tons of decks. Okay. Ashar in Gardens versus Smuggler's Run. This is kind of a fun comparison. I always like comparing across classes. But a bit of a murder if you look at it. Uh, Smuggler's Run back in the day for Mean Streets. Uh, give all minions in your hand plus one, plus one. Sharn Gardens does that. Gives all minions in your hand plus one, plus one. But you also get Sunken Gardens, which is basically a four mana paladin spell. <laughs> there is Invigorating Sermon, which does exactly what Sunken Gardens does. But it's four mana. And Sunken Gardens is only one mana, uh, which is of course, pretty crazy, and it's not even really getting played that much. I've seen a few lists floating around. There's some stuff at the Master Store this weekend. There's some, some like, beastie aggro druids running gardens because of, you know, multiple good dredge options available for aggro decks. But it's still not, like, crazy overpowered or anything. It's like a Kelaseth 
and it's not even that good, which is crazy. It's it's sort of silly how these like Keliseth style cards can't even keep up, but pretty clearly distinctly different. Now, you know, when you're comparing across classes, of course, you have to consider like the context. Uh, I actually think in some ways Druid is better able to leverage a card like Asharan and Sunken Gardens because they have a lot of good aggro minions, but Paladin has Divine Shields which Druid doesn't have. And Divine Shields kind of duplicate your stats across, you know, the shield and the base minion, which can make hand buffs go a little bit further in Paladin, which is one of the reasons we've seen it as a successful mechanic in that class. So one could argue, you know, Smuggler's Run is sort of fairly matched here because of the Divine Shield aspect. I would say, you know, Tonkin Garden still feels like a bit of a murder because it's just so much stuff. It's crazy stats and... It's still a four mana Paladin spell that's currently in rotation, right? So if you're considering that for Paladin, uh, it's still much, much faster than Paladin, which again, maybe that was balanced for Divine Shields, but it's just crazy, crazy fast. Next up, this is a cool comparison. Holy Maki Roll versus both Forbidden Healing and Witch's Brew. So we had Witch's Brew for Shaman. Basically, Holy Maki Roll is Witch's Brew, but split into more pieces, which of course can be great for odd cost turns. If you're on five mana, you can't play three Witch's Brews, but you can play five Holy Maki Rolls. So you net some health in those cases. Uh, can be bonus spell activation. So, you know, if you got anything that benefits from playing multiple spells, Holy Maki Roll can play you more of those. So that uh, divisibility is really nice at one mana. And then Forbidden Healing compared to Holy Maki Roll, they both heal the same amount per mana. They both heal two per one mana. But Holy Maki Roll has, again, flexibility. Forbidden Healing, it's your whole turn. It's all you got. You can play it at the end of the turn, but it's it's a full commitment. Holy Maki Roll, you can kind of weave in and out of wild pyromancers and stuff. You have more flexibility for it. So I think Holy Maki Roll does the exact same thing as Forbidden Healing in every scenario, but in other scenarios, it's just way, way better. I like, I like this, by the way. I think it's a really good example of cards giving players more control, more agency over their decisions. Forbidden Healing, it was like, oh, man, this is going to be tough to work with. Whereas Maki Roll, you have a lot more flexibility to do it when you want and how you want, which is very nice. I think it's good to give players more control. And it's not like it's added complexity or, or burden either, right? It's still very easy to understand and deal with. So you get a lot of upside without any real downside. As far as I'm concerned, a great evolution of this design. So it is a murder, but again, a pretty good murder. In fact, I don't actually think any of these have been problematic so far. I don't think any of these so far have been examples of unhealthy murders, unhealthy power creep or anything of the sort. I think they've all actually been pretty good examples. They all take designs into the next level, but you know, still within a healthy standpoint for modern day Hearthstone. So this one's kind of intriguing. This is the least direct of the comparisons we've had so far, but still feel like these cards are very much in the same vein. They're both three mana rogue weapons that go up to four attack based on a condition. Now, Hook Scimitar is a much easier condition, sort of. <laughs> like combo, for instance, can go into any deck and you'll still be able to combo it, but it also demands often more mana. Like you might have to play a one mana card with Scimitar, which means you play it on turn four. Whereas Swordfish, you have to have Pirate, so it's more limited in its deck choices, but you can also play it on curve sometimes very easily and it might whiff, right? You don't have full control necessarily, but very often you're getting to play it as a 4-3 on three mana, whereas Hooked Scimitar, you know, sometimes you have to delay it a couple turns and it's only a 4-2. So Swordfish often just nets you four extra damage. And on top of that, you get to Dredge, which of course has some utility because you get to pick your draws and that can be very helpful to help you find things that you're looking for, even if that means not picking a pirate. And you get to buff a pirate as well. Sometimes that plus two attack, like on the three mana draw a pirate guy, is really good, making him a Yeti instead of a 2-5. That can really help in the mid game, I found. So in a lot of ways, Swordfish just absolutely trounces. Trounces, is that a word? Demolishes Hooked Scimitar. Just 12 damage instead of eight. Pirate attack upside, dredge upside. It's just really good, but it will be naturally more limited. It can only be played successfully probably in pirate decks. So it doesn't have as much cross deck flexibility, but higher power output when it functions basically and a lot of people think swordfish is too good and might be nerfed uh maybe 
it's it's very crazy when it works and pirates are flying but it, it's again kind of limited to its own specific deck case so this is like probably power creep because hooked scimitar is a very good card but it's it's controlled it's you know it's tightened into a single deck archetype which might be a fine example of power creep because it's not broadly blowing up the meta three mana 12 damage is kind of crazy yeah that's a good point super base yeah plus one attack yeah, that would probably be reasonable i'm i mean i'm not itching to nerf this right now because pirate rogue is fine this card is definitely on the higher end of the power range but it's not like the deck's crazy good or anything everybody thinks this one is power creep indeed okay i mean it's one of those that's teetering on unhealthy power creep i would say like it's you know i'm like uh you know if he gets a couple more good pirates or the meta moves this could be a really scary good card but at the moment i think it's okay it's because pirates are kind of limited so this is an interesting example <laughs> we're kind of going backwards here we got two cards that murdered arcane shot for hunter uh, of course arcane shot is a very good card still played today in quest hunter important part of quest hunter has been played a lot over time because hunter loves damage and both barb nets and scalding geyser both murdered arcane shot scalding geyser uh is exactly the same but it gets dredge which of course dredge is really good helping you find cards helping you find damage helping you find curve and barb nets is arcane shot but sometimes you get to hit a second thing with it which of course can be very nice helping you tidy up boards or you know kill something and still hit face of course it does demand a naga which you might say uh well you know it demands a naga that's a condition that makes it weaker but at a base level it's just an extra arcane shot and it gets played that way very often so um it's just it's just better uh it's just about now it doesn't have an arcane tag but of course that's not something that has been relevant for hunter thus far multicaster could be but uh two examples of cards that just evolve on arcane shot now i i actually think both these are fine i don't think these feel like power outliers they don't feel too crazy good to me or anything i think they're they're good examples of making a more interesting arcane shot both of these are the same base output of damage but they give you well barbnets can be more but they give you like you know uh, deck building thoughts they give you i gotta play nagas they give you decision making in the moment with dredge examples of two cards that just are more interesting and more fun i think and it's not always power creep i know as i've said every every card in this video so far <laughs> I, I agree uh i think most of these are, are totally fine as i've always there's always people in the comments who, of youtube who will ignore this a thousand times over and i'll make fun of them like i always do uh, these are not power creep videos. I've never said they're power creep videos. I'm not saying these are bad evolutions or that the game is snowballing out of control. This is broken. It's crazy. I just like comparing cards over time. It's really more about design evolution is usually how I discuss these, right? I talk about how these interact in more interesting ways and why they're important, how they've changed. It's, it's not a power creep conversation. And we're done. That's it. That's all I got. By the way, apparently the word creep has been getting auto modded. I just saw that. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> uh, thanks creep is us being a jerk. So people say power creep. It's getting auto modded sometimes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I didn't see that. Okay, guys, I gotta go. Good chat. Murdered cards.